a little bit of popularity just because they are a highly nutritious crop. They've got a lot of beta carotene, calcium, uh, vitamin C, and then sulfur. Uh, which makes them, like I say, highly nutritious. Uh, coal crops all belong to the brassica group, and you hear us talk many times um, about crop rotation and knowing our family names, and that's going to be a critical component that we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, again, coal crops origin dates back to um, wild mustard. Just an interesting tidbit for you, uh, the brassica vegetables, they all share a common feature. Um, all the Flowers are four petaled that makes them look like the Greek cross and that's where the name crucifers or cruciferous veggies came from. Uh, the brassica species uh, does grow wild a lot in the Mediterranean region. That's where um, the first brassica was developed. Uh, there are other similar species that are in the brassica family, but to, for today, we're gonna primarily spend our time talking the, about the brassica or racy species. But you have these listed here, so you can see what some of those other family members are as well. So you can see it's a pretty big family overall. The cool thing about cold crops is that they are the same species of plant. You'll see there at the bottom that I've made the comment that they're man-made, although not GMO, which is another unique feature of, of the brassica family. Um, it's just been um, human selection over years and years uh, to create all of these different species of plants because they're all kind of one and one and the same. Um, I would disagree with that on some of the taste tests, but you know, that's a whole other story. But this is a good picture to just kind of show you how that evolution took place from that wild species and how some of the other crops were, were created. Um, it's kind of unique that cabbage was actually leafy to start with before um, it was selected to have that large firm head. Um, kale was probably one of the first adaptations to the crop. It was, again, one of those grown as a leafy vegetable uh, for thousands of years, but then um, folks started preferring those tight, tight heads, and that's how the cabbage head, as we know it today, um, came to be. And kohlrabi is another one. It was during about the same time that cabbages were, were being selected for those large heads that kohlrabi was being selected in Germany. and um, Kohlrabi is another one of those cold crops that's growing in popularity, but it's actually what we refer to as a stem turnip because you're actually eating the edible stem, which again goes back to um, cold crops. You can pretty much eat every component of the plant. So even kohlrabi, we're eating, eating that for the stem. You can also eat the green component of that as well. So um, this just kind of expands on that timeline a little bit. Um, cauliflower was the next one of the cold crops to be developed and then it was about a hundred years after cauliflower that broccoli came along. And cauliflower got the name just because it looks like a bunch of grapes which you know the Mediterranean is also very well known for. And Brussels sprouts have a unique origin just because they were created in an area near Brussels, Belgium. So just for the grammar folks and the little historical snippet, uh, Brussels sprouts will always be spelled like Brussels. Some people think it only has that one L, but it's actually two. So um, the name for Brussels sprout actually means just garden cabbage bearing gem. So we've got all these very distinctive vegetables, but they all come from one plant. So that's just what's kind of unique to the brassica family. When it comes to growing cold crops, that's the reason that we started out with this group of plants because now is going to be the time that we want to be thinking about putting those in the garden. We're going to utilize those because uh, again they're called cool season crops so we're going to use those in the garden in, in the springtime um, har um, harvesting in the early summer or we're going to produce those as a late fall crop. You can start seed indoors. You want to do that about four to six weeks um, before transplanting. Um, and you can see the different, I'm not gonna go through all of this, just in the essence of time. And this is actually in your um, publication that we're gonna be sending you to, but, because each one of these species is gonna be a little bit different in how we're, how we're transplanting. Uh, this chart is also in your publication, so make sure you refer to that. Uh, cold crops, they do mature in cool weather of spring or fall. That's another one of the things that makes them unique. They like that temperature around 60 to 65 degrees. Um, Typically this time of year is when you start seeing transplants being sold at local box stores and local nurseries and greenhouses. 
One thing that you don't want to do is subject uh, cold crop seedlings to a temperature below 50 degrees for more than 10 days, or we're going to have premature flowering um, of the plant. You can see how that how that looks there, and that can actually destroy uh, the potential for a good good harvest. And we've been making jokes about Mother Nature here in the last few weeks because we just really don't know what she's going to throw at us next. So, you know, we could have snow in the summertime for all we know. So uh, some of these things are kind of hard to gauge, and, and that's going to depend on what part of the state you're in as well. When you are going to purchase transplants, one of the biggest things you need to do is look and make sure they have four to five true leaves, and you want that really deep blue-green color um, because you remember that cold crops in and their natural origin are a leafy green. So um, we want that deep blue green color. Always investigate um, your transplants that you're purchasing. You know, make sure you look those over. You don't want to be purchasing something that has some nutrient deficiencies. Sometimes in uh, box stores and things, we'll see transplants that are yellow, um, maybe have a purple tint to it. And that's going to be indicative of nitrogen deficiency. And you can kind of see there the difference in the color from that first picture. So we don't want to be taking um, something like this uh, to our garden right out of the right out of the gate. So um, also look at those containers. Make sure that they're not root bound. Uh, we don't. We want our root system to look good, look healthy. We want white roots. Uh, we want them to be vigorously growing, but we don't want them to be pot bound. So take those out and, and check them out before you take them home. As far as site selection, full sun is going to be pretty critical. Um, we've got one or two that can withstand a little bit of shade, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes, more so than some of our other species within the brassica family. As with any crop, we want to do a soil test to begin with. That's going to get our pH where we need it to be, which is about 6.5. Uh, the kale and the collards are going to be a little bit fussier about that. You can actually have a little bit lower pH, um, but pretty much a 6.2 to 6.5 is where you want to be growing your cold, cold crops. And again, because they are uh, considered a leafy crop, uh, an application of pre-plant uh, pre fertilizer is going to be recommended and, and then an application of side dressing two to four weeks after transplant. We want to keep putting the nutrition to them. We don't want them to um, start suffering some deficiencies and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But um, all of your production is going to start at the soil level so just remember to make those amendments before you plant. Another unique thing about your uh, cold crops you know, I know in East Tennessee, we have a lot of heavy clay soils. They're probably one of the few garden vegetables that are gonna be okay with that clay soil, just as long as you've got good drainage. So not all clay's bad. Um, again, just adjust the soil there. If you're gonna add um, manure or compost, make sure that that's well composted and make sure you get that application in about three weeks before you plant. And again, these recommendations are gonna be in that publication. Uh, weeds and water, of course, with any crop are going to be critical, but uh, cold crops are really shallow rooted, so maybe a little bit more of a, of a critical need uh, for both of these uh, cultural practices. We, we don't want the weeds to get, a, get ahead of us, so sometimes adding the mulch is going to be a, a good production practice to get into, and you can see the difference there, because once the weeds take over, it's hard to pull, pull those out by I mean, you can pull those out by hand, but it's a little bit harder to cultivate like with the hoe or anything like that. So always keep ahead of that. Uh, mulching is gonna just conserve that soil moisture. It's gonna help minimize um, plants, plant stress. So, um, so slowly soaking that soil about once or twice a week, that's gonna help push some of those roots um, a little bit deeper. Because of course, if we're out there watering every day, just a little dab here and a little dab there, that's gonna help promote those roots to spread out closer to the um, level, the soil level, and we don't want that. So about an inch of water per week, if we can do that, um, would be great. And this just shows you a picture how people are utilizing straw there. Uh, just do remember that straw is different from hay. Um, we don't wanna be introducing weed seeds into our gardens either, so be really careful about where you're purchasing um, your straw, make sure it's clean. And this just shows you again what that root system looks like and you can tell that you know versus a tomato plant for instance it's not it's not going to go near as deep as a tomato or pepper plant so you can see how those spread out. 
Cultivating, again, you need to be really careful with that. You see how this guy here has got, got the matic there kind of in the center of those plants. Uh, you don't want to get too close to the plant just because of, of damaging those roots and it can stunt your, stunt your plants back. Okay, so that's just a general overview of growing cold crops in general. Uh, one thing I would just remind you to refer to that publication because um, seeding depth, plant spacing, row spacing um, are going to be just a, a little bit different depending on which particular species that you're growing. So, so refer to that. And as we move through this presentation in the next few slides, um, I'm not going to review all those numbers because you're going to have that written down and we'll try to stick with more of the general content. But, and again, um, each one of these introductory slides is going to have a little snippet of information, um, just a, a historical co component. Um, this one just tells you that Thomas Jefferson, who was America's first farmer, actually had documentation of when he, he grew broccoli there at his home in Monticello in May of 1767. And uh, you got to have a little humor. So if y'all are noticing, it, this is not real scientific names of all this, but this is a little fun if you're working with uh, children, uh, especially this chocolate broccoli here. You can see it's eaten by children and insane parents. So, uh, and then you've got your math broccoli and your fool's broccoli, but like I say, you can use that or, or not. But Calabrese, that's going to be your large heading portion of broccoli and thick stalks. This is what most of your folks are taking to markets. Uh, that's what you're seeing in, in box stores at the grocery store. You can see a picture of that there. This variety was actually, like I say, developed in Italy years ago. Um, most of your commercial markets are only going to sell green broccoli, and perhaps if you saw that little flash up there, maybe if some of our presidents got the opportunity to eat purple broccoli, they would have liked it a little bit better. You just never know about that. But there's lots of different colors of, of broccoli on the market now. Um, they actually resemble cauliflower more, but they taste like broccoli. So we're starting to see some of those things show up on, on uh, supermarket shelves now too. Um, when you're harvesting broccoli, you see how this guy has used a knife and that picture on the right hand side, you, you want to utilize a knife, you don't want to be just breaking that off because that can leave what I call straggles at the top of that plant. And when we do that, it's not a clean break and that can introduce pathogens to the crop. So um, make sure that you're using a knife. And if you leave it in the ground long enough, even after you harvest this, you can get side shoots, which help extend the harvest. And you can see that picture there of what, of what that's gonna look like. Um, over maturity, you see, that's gonna cause a woodiness. It's almost like broccoli uh, like okra if you leave it too long uh, it's just that starch to sugar conversion in the plant uh, it's what we call lignans and that's just a stringy fibrous material that even when you cook that broccoli it's it's not going to be very good and you see from this picture that broccoli is probably the cold crop that's going to tolerate frost the least so be very careful with that even though they're called a cool season plant um, not all are going to be able to withstand frost and broccoli again is the one that's going to be least um, I guess resistant to that. You've also got some combinations because again um, all of these um, can hybridize, they can cross with one another so broccoli flower and collabrock are starting to uh, make a run for the supermarket shelves as well, all kinds of different varieties out there. Uh, these cultivars are again in your publication and these are the ones that, that do well here across Tennessee. Um, again, just another snippet of Brussels sprouts. Um, this was a crop that was being grown for years that scientists didn't even really, uh, they knew it existed, but they didn't know what it looked like. Uh, folks like this one because it's, it's high in vitamin C, um, high in potassium, and the unique thing too about Brussels sprouts, if you can see that picture there at the very top, it, it will actually, some varieties will terminate into a head of a cabbage. So again, that just kind of shows the selection of these plants over years and years, and you can, you can see that here. Brussels um, sprouts are hip now. All the millennials like them. Oh yes, they are. And they're a cool little plant to grow. I mean, you always get, uh, children really like them too, just because they're so curious looking, so. Um, as your heavy frosts start approaching late in the season, uh, you want to make sure that you're pinching that growing tip back, and that way you're, other sprouts are going to enlarge before 
before the frost hits. Brussels sprouts are going to take a little bit longer for maturity than your other cool, um, cool season crops. And you don't want sunshine um, because, or in not sunshine, but in the heavy heat of summer, you don't want these maturing because it's going to make them taste more bitter. And they're going to have a lot stronger flavor, especially the sulfur compounds. And it is going to be the most cold hardy of all your um, cold crops. Um, this just gives you an idea of how to harvest those. We get a lot of questions in here on, on how to harvest Brussels sprouts. So uh, you want to make sure that they're firm. And before that companion leaf, there's a companion leaf with each one of those sprouts. Um, before that leaf turns yellow is when you want to be, be harvesting that. And then we have a list there of cultivars that do well here. And you can see that one is, a, is good for a fall crop because it's even growing in parts of uh, New Jersey in December. Then moving on to cabbage, um, it's going to take about two to two and a half months for cabbage to produce. It, there's many, many different kinds of varieties um, of cabbage out there, probably more so than any of the other cold crops. Uh, people really like cabbage for the uh, nutritional content. Probably several of you have heard of the uh, cabbage soup diet. So they say you can sustain on uh, cabbages and sweet potatoes for a lifetime. I'm not going to put that to test, but I've heard that. So. Just some more interesting snippets there um, showing the just the selection of these plants over the years and where some, some of this terminology comes from. Again, these are things you can utilize in presentations or not, but some people like that little historical component. Um, notice here that when you're planting cabbages this time of year, you want to make sure that they are early or mid-season varieties and then save those later um, varieties for those summer plantings because they're going to form a tighter head which is going to allow you to be able to use those for storage cabbages a little bit longer in the winter time. So just keep that in mind. Maturity indicators on your cabbages. Um, I don't know if you can see that very well but when that outer leaf on the head starts curling back no matter what the size is but when you when you see that leaf starting to curl back that's when it's time um, to harvest. And you can also see this picture on the on the right. Um, you can twist those heads a little bit. That's going to help break off some of the feeder, feeder roots and limit your water uptake. And that's going to reduce splitting. And all splitting is, is a physiological response uh, to too much water. Um, it's a problem as those heads mature that we we see sometimes it's basically it's just like a tomato when a tomato cracks um, plants basically turn themselves off when they're ready to be picked when they're ready to be harvested um, but if we start pushing the water to that they basically flip their switch back on and that's what causes this phenomena so they just start splitting but one way to to remedy that especially if weather is you know, like it's been in the last couple of weeks here, uh, you can actually take a hoe or a spade and go around the base of that plant and chop up some of those roots. And that's going to stress that plant enough to where it's not going to have sufficient water uptake and reduce that from occurring. Another phenomena is uh, bolting. And we see this with, with all of our cold crops. Um, anytime it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit or, or lower for several weeks consistently, that's going to cause bolting, which is just premature formation of seed. And you can see in that picture there on the left, the larger those leaves are, typically three to four inches um, wide or wider, that is going to occur more frequently. And that's just a better visual so you can see what that looks like. And you can, you can tell from looking at that that, uh, that significantly reduces um, our yield and our productivity of those plants. Um, this is unique to cabbages, but it's very similar to some other phenomena that we see going on with other garden vegetables. So I'm, I'm sure that many of you, at maybe one point or another, have seen this. Um, this is basically almost like uh, blossom end rot in tomatoes. Um, it's it's moisture, uh, moisture fluctuations, the inconsistency there that goes back to what we talked about already, making sure we get about an inch to an inch and a half of water on that crop per week um, because when we start fluctuating that moisture level, then that starts fluctuating our calcium uptake. And this causes 
tip burn. And we don't see this, you know, on a tomato, we see that in, in our gardens, you know, we can actually see what that looks like, but you don't know that you had this issue until you actually go to cut, cut that cabbage open. So that's why it's so critical to maintain um, those adequate moisture levels throughout the season. Another thing that's very similar to this is boron deficiency. Cold crops actually use a little bit more boron than some of our other garden crops. Uh, this is another thing you don't necessarily just see to look at the plant, but when you cut that stalk open, that's what boron deficiency is gonna look like. And again, that's just a, that's caused by those moisture fluctuations. Cultivars of cabbages that do well in Tennessee are listed here. Those are also listed in your publication. I like this quote on cauliflower from Mark Twain because it says cauliflower is nothing but a cabbage with a college education. So that's kind of, kind of a cute little quote. But the only difference here between cauliflower and um, um, broccoli, and I know my master gardeners got, had Natalie up here a few weeks ago talking about botany. So they should know what that white inflorescent meristem is. That's the only, the only difference in those. Basically, it just means that it's a, a heading broccoli. Uh, you'll have varying opinions, but a lot of folks will say that this is a little bit harder to grow than broccoli or Brussels sprouts. And a lot of that is going to be um, due to temperature. If you get really intense heat again, it can um, cause that curd not to form or even be discolored. Um, this one is going to be a little bit more sensitive to some of those uh, moisture fluctuations. If you, if you have lack of water, um, it's going to lead to um, just a really small woody type curd development. Let's see. In order to achieve the white color, uh, most of these varieties are going to have to be blanched, which is an extra step that you have to take when you're growing cauliflower. Although there are some um, self-blanching varieties that are on the market, all that means is that the leaves are really, really tall and they come up over that um, curd to shield it from sunlight. But even some of those self um, blanching varieties, you may want to go ahead and tie those leaves up um, with a rubber band or with clothespins or something like that. But um, cauliflower is another one. If you leave the curds on the plant for too long, they become what we call ricey, which I think now in grocery stores, we're starting to see that in the freezer aisles, uh, riced cauliflower and things. Cause it's, it's one of those that uh, is starting to take the place of some of our carbs like potatoes and things but um, one unique thing with cauliflower it's better to cut it a little early than it is a little late because even if you're leaving it a little bit longer it's going to reduce the quality of those curds and you can kind of see what that's going to look like there. These are just some pictures of blanching so you can see how that process works and again we just want to shield that from sunlight it's going to make that cluster much more white and it's going to be um, more delicate in flavor and have just a little bit of a smoother appearance. And start that process when the head is about three inches or the size of a teacup. Uh, purple cauliflower, that's just a cross between cauliflower and broccoli. Uh, the cool thing is when you cook it, it turns green. So those of you working with youth audiences, this is a neat one to maybe incorporate in some of those um, lessons. Cultivars are listed here. Again, they're also in your publication. Then moving on to collards, um, this is pretty much a staple of the South. It's starting to gain in popularity um, in the North, but by and large, uh, you, you see this grown pretty uh, pretty prolifically, especially uh, in our in our coastal states, it's a big part of um, of the diet in the South. And just remember that collards and kale they're actually just both a, a loose leaf, non-heading wild cabbage. There are a few differences, of course, between your collards and your kale. Collards are going to be a medium green color and have that smooth texture. Those leaves are gonna be more oval shaped and uh, they're gonna taste a little bit milder than kale. Kale's gonna have a little bit stronger, more bitter flavor to it. And um, kale's gonna have those dark gray, green, um, fluffy, lacy looking leaves. And there's a picture just to kind of show the how those look. 
another thing that's going to affect your collards and kale is um, temperature. Both of these are going to taste a little bit better when they get frost on them. And I say that that's just a matter of preference. Some people like that bitter taste. It just it just kind of uh, depends on what your preference is. But collards are one that we think uh, grows very well in the in the heat of the summer months. That's another reason in, in our coastal areas in the south they produce quite well. Kale's going to be more of a winter crop. You can actually grow it through the winter months. But again, once they get frost on them, they're both going to taste a little bit sweeter. Um, these are going to mature pretty quickly in your garden. You can actually do some succession plantings of both of these. These are the ones that are a little bit fussier about your pH. So if you're growing an entire field, you definitely want to make sure that you're doing um, a soil sample and amending that soil with organic matter, making sure you've got good, good drainage for these. Make sure that you're keeping that soil moist. Some people will even utilize um, a row cover and there'll be some pictures of those in the end of the presentation. So you'll see what those look like. Um, just remember, again, collards and kale both are leafy in stature. So we want to make sure that we're getting adequate nitrogen on there um, and fertility because we want to make sure that we're meeting the nutritional needs. These are one that's going to keep on growing throughout the season. Collards, uh, they are a biennial like all of your cold crops. They're going to put up a stalk the second year. So if you're overwintering that crop, just be aware of that. Uh, plants can become rather large. So pay really close attention to your plant spacings on the collards. And of course, that'll be dependent on your variety as well. You'll notice that last point there, midsummer plantings produce the best yield and you can harvest those all the way up into early winter, depending on what part of the state you're in. Make sure when you're harvesting that you're um, not disturbing that central growing tip. And that way that that plant is going to keep producing for you throughout the season. And again, cool weather is just going to change that starch to sugar conversion in the plant. Uh, those flavor proteins are going to change a little bit, so that's why they're going to taste a little bit sweeter in the cooler weather. And you can see there how big those leaves can get. Um, folks are starting to even utilize those, chopping those um, midribs up for crunch and salads and things like that now too. Um, Bates is always a go-to uh, staple variety in the south. They're a little bit more resistant to bolting and insect damage in the, in the winter months. You can kind of see what the difference in those two varieties look like. The Georgia is going to be a little bit more upright. As far as your collards versus kale, um, they're going to flourish in almost any climate. Uh, they're going to be frost tolerant, but they're going to thrive in the warm weather as well as some of um, those cooler climates as, as well. They can survive in temperatures as low as five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, but kale's gonna do a little bit better in the cold and collards are gonna tolerate the heat better. So that's one big um, difference between the two. Just remember that uh, heat, hot weather can um, make those collards really bitter. So kind of like what she's demonstrating here. And that's not me, but it could be me because that's kind of how I feel. And for Green County sitting in there, they're probably saying, yeah, that's Melody eating cilantro. Um, here are your cultivars. Again, these all do very well in Tennessee. And then we have our kale. And here's the cool thing about kale, even all that ornamental kale that you see at the greenhouse nursery um, operations in the fall, you can eat those too. All of those are edible not just for ornamental. Again, just make sure that you're keeping that soil moist because that's gonna help keep those leaves sweet and crisp. You don't want them tough and bitter. And again, just make sure that you're side dressing throughout the season. And mulch, a mulch application to kale is gonna be really good too because it's gonna help keep that soil surface cooler. We've got uh, lots of different cultivars of kale in Tennessee that have performed quite well. Then moving on to kohlrabi, again, this is, this is the edible stem. It's not a root crop, it's just a stem tournament. It's best harvested uh, before that bulb gets about three inches in diameter. It's gonna be about tennis ball size. And again, it's gonna depend on the variety, but most of the time if they get bigger than that, they're gonna get a little fibrous. Um, you can direct seed these. 
They can withstand pretty heavy frost. This is one that you can leave in the ground through wintertime. You gotta be careful about bolting though, because if, if you're getting some daily highs over 50 degrees Fahrenheit, um, they will start that early, early flowering. And notice there that growth times are about seven to eight weeks. Kohlrabi is the one that kind of prefers that heavy so, uh, soil. So if you've got a heavy clay area in a garden, kohlrabi will usually perform quite well for you. And this is also the one that can withstand a little bit more shade. You can take them down to four to five hours of sunlight and typically kohlrabi is gonna perform quite nicely for you. Again, I keep putting this on every slide, but we've got to remember that all of our cold crops and our cool season plants are gonna be heavy feeders. So we want to be um, making sure we're applying nitrogen throughout the season. And these are cultivars of our kohlrabi in Tennessee. And then just two others I wanted to mention was mustard and turnip greens, because again, all your cold crops evolved from the wild mustard growing um, in, the, in the Mediterranean. It's the same family, brassica, just a little bit different species, but um, both of these are, are grown um, pretty prolifically here in Tennessee, and both of these are also included in the publication, so you'll have those to reference to. Hey, so, Melody, you want yeah. to look at the poll um, numbers oh. before you jump into insects and diseases? So over the last few minutes, people have been giving us feedback on what some of the biggest challenges uh, they've experienced in growing cold crops. And in a very strong majority, a lot of the feedback that we're getting is seasonality or timing issues are some of the biggest challenge or poor growth after planting, reasonable growth, but not great harvest quality. And so I think that, you know, what we're really seeing is maybe more um, env weather, environment, um, nutrition challenges versus insect and disease issues, which is interesting. And you know, I think a lot of times we, or we go to a garden center and we're tempted to plant, you know, things like broccoli and Brussels sprouts and especially cauliflower too late in the spring. And a lot of times in many parts of Tennessee, some of those are really challenging as a spring crop, could very well be true this spring, right? And when we get them in and they're missing that 60 to 65 degree weather, you know, we could really just be getting very poor quality. I think of many of them, especially the more um, flowering types um, as being more of a fall crop. Sometimes I won't even um, try that battle in the springtime. The other thing I think about, and you know, anybody else can chime in, is that there may also be some fertility issues at play. I mean, just like you, you just said, fast, consistent growth is crucial for brassicas. And I wonder if some of the, you know, seasonality or poor timing issues might be, yeah, they might be getting in a little bit late, or it could be that really early in the season, that fertility is not there um, to get them growing fast. And when we get them started off slow, then we're just really never going to get our peak production under the cooler temperatures. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. That's why I, I keep saying that about the, uh, the pre-plant application of your nitrogen fertilizer, making sure you're doing that soil test, amending it with good quality organic matter, um, side dressing, those crops, I mean, it's going to differ a little bit, but especially for the leafy greens, you know, you're going to have to make those applications typically more than once. Mm -hmm. And it is a unique um, timeline there trying to figure out, especially with the season we're having right now, when we need to be, like you say, getting those crops in the ground. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, by the time home gardeners here in East Tennessee take cold crops home in May, we're already past that mm -hmm. point. Uh, for them to we be. We can't buy them with our peppers and tomatoes. It's <laughs> just not a system. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And, you know, I mean, that's that's kind of sad that those are even still available uh, for purchase at that time, but, you know, we that's something we can't do nothing about. But we noticed here even in East Tennessee that, that typically cold crops um, are going to perform a little better as a fall crop. Of course, we're all wanting to get out this time of year and, and have that first flush of growth and, you know, have something coming out of the garden pretty early, but um, most of the time, these are going to perform a little bit better 
in the fall and even extending some of these productions into the winter time. And not only that, but like this next section, you know, disease and insect pressure is going to be a lot lower in the fall than it would be in the springtime, especially for your cabbage loopers and things like that. Yeah. And one of the questions that's in the uh, chat box is about um, pre-plant fertilizers. And, you know, oftentimes our pre-plant recommendation will be a complete fertilizer. Now that depends on, you know, what your phosphorus and your potassium levels are in the soil, but often for our side dressing, especially for these fast growing types of crops, that may be a, a straight nitrogen. And so it could be, um, could be a ammonium nitrate, or it could be, you know, a more organic form of, of straight nitrogen, like uh, blood meal or something like that. And actually I put it in the chat box. Um, we just got a note from Bradley County about organic fertilizers, but we have a new home garden fertility publication that's coming out really soon. And it has specifics for side dressing for different crops with both conventional and organic fertilizers, because those often have lower um, percentages in what they provide. So it has really specific um, directions for that. So we are, we're working on addressing these exact questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, and if we look at the second question, we ask folks what their favorite crop were to go in. Kale and broccoli rising to the top. Kale, of course, very versatile for our containers and raised beds and all those um, yeah. applications. So, all right, I will, I will let you continue. I just thought that'd be a fun way to jump in for some of the questions that we were seeing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really cool. How much time? I don't, I can't see a clock on my thing on my computer. Um, you've got about five minutes to, okay. um, wrap up and then we'll do our ending, um, activity with a lot of the questions that you've already seen before and, uh, we're in good shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, before we get into this insect and disease uh, component, just make sure on that publication that, we, that, we're, that we're sending you to look at the very last page, the back page. That's going to give you some descriptors for each one of these. And like Natalie said too, a lot of the things that I've already showed you are physiological in nature. And a lot of times people bring those specimens in thinking it's disease or insect damage, when in reality it all goes back to our, our fertility efforts. Okay, I'm locked up. It's not letting me advance. There we go. Okay, this is one um, that you're going to see on occasion. It's bacterial in nature. You see when you when you cut the head, uh, cut the stem, you're going to see that black ring around the stem. That is um, bacterial black, black rot. Um, it, it does overwinter on any kind of plant debris that you're leaving in the ground. So I'm going to go ahead and throw that out there because I preach this to um, the Green County group all the time. You don't want to leave any kind of debris or material. Um, old plants, spent plants in your garden. As they're done, take them out. Um, if you've had disease issues, burn those plants, get rid of those plants because they will overwinter and you're just gonna have more disease pressure in the following year. Bacterial is gonna be hard to control, but again, copper products can help slow the progression of that disease. And I'm gonna move through these pretty fast, y'all, just in essence of time. Alternaria is one that we see quite often um, in cold crops. You can see that big spot there. It looks like a target spot. And again, uh, this is one that can overwinter. So just make sure that you're moving this material out of the garden because um, each one of those, I'm wanting to point, I know y'all can't see me, but each one of those um, um, circles there on the leaf, that's, that's spores. There are spores on the back side of that leaf that are just going to produce and, and go and travel to your neighbors and everywhere else and spores are just always going to be in the air. So just make sure you're removing that material. I put some fungicide recommendations up there for you. So just refer to that. And then cabbage worms are going to be the biggest insect pressure. And again, like I say, we don't see the pressure in the fall like we do in the springtime because we all know um, the little white butterflies that we see flying around. Uh, this time of year, um, we get excited, but those are actually cabbage loopers. They're getting ready to lay their eggs in your newly formed cabbage heads and uh, can't always see that. And then before you know it, you've got cabbage loopers voraciously eating uh, your 
-hmm. your leaves of your cabbage plants and everything right here. I've got a picture of that. So pretty tiny worm can cause a great deal of damage. And typically the damage is going to be in the center of those leaves in between the, the big midribs and the veins of the leaf. They're going to be on the underside. That's another thing you got to make sure when you're inspecting to look on the underside. We say as far as a threshold limit, you know, two to three worms per plant because they do have such a voracious appetite. So this is something you're really going to weigh, uh, want to pay close attention to and get this under, con under control. And you can see there how small he is, but he's going to get fat really quick. Don't take him long to eat, eat down on uh, cabbage worms. Um, flea beetles are another issue we typically see in the springtime. This, they're called flea beetles because they hop around like little fleas do, uh, but they have the tendency to skeletonize leaves and anytime we're removing that leaf surface, then of course we're uh, removing photosynthesis and that plant can't grow. So kind of see what that looks like there. And again, I'm going to zip on through this. One thing I will mention though, if you're companion planting, um, any of your mints and your garlic, onion, all of those will, will help reduce some of those populations. Chinese cabbages, they actually prefer that. So you can plant a trap crop of those around, uh, around your garden and they will eat on that before they'll eat on any of your other um, coal crops. I put a slide in here for diatomaceous earth. We get a lot of phone calls and questions about that. So all that material is there for you to, to utilize. Just some more pictures to see damage, how quickly cabbage worms can damage your cold crops. Um, organic control, like Natalie said, we're working on a pub for that, but hand picking and destroying any of those worms is gonna help. Or utilizing old pantyhose or a floating row cover, and you can see how this is done in both of these pictures here. Just making sure that um, you're covering the surface of that plant so those butterflies, the moths, can't get in there and lay their eggs in, in the cabbage or in the broccoli or whatever. Um, you're just preventing them from doing that. Uh, you want to encourage um, beneficial insects to come into the garden. All of these, the ground beetles, uh, wasps, spiders, and lacewings, they're gonna prey on cabbage worms. So when you see these critters, um, they're actually gonna be serving a pretty good purpose in the garden. I put a slide here about the BT. You can use those to control um, the worms themselves, but now just remember it's, it's not gonna work on the eggs or the moths themselves. It's only going to work on, on the caterpillar. And, and it's great because really short, um, you know, right up to the day of harvest. So for leafy crops, it's a good tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you are you utilizing any other kind of fungicide spray, just notice there, make sure that you're, you're getting it down into the folds of the cabbage in those tight places where um, all those worms reside. And again, and again, this is just giving you some information on the floating rows, We're just keeping them out of our crop. And lots of different mechanisms to employ this in your garden. So you can just see a couple of those there. But with that, we'll finish up. I'm sorry we had to get a little bit fast there at the very end, but again, you'll have all this information in our publication. Uh, we are gonna make this presentation available to you so you can uh, adapt it however you need to, um, as well as sending you out the PowerPoint of the slide. So you'll have that for your reference today as well.